Hello and welcome to The Last Standee, a board gaming podcast coming to you from four countries across Europe. David's not available for this recording, but he'll be here next time, and don't you worry. Which means I'm joined here today by Alexi. Which means I'm joined here today by Alexis. Hi, that's me. Alessio. Hi, everyone. Audrey. Hey, salut. And I'm your host, Fen. We're going to be talking about a range of different topics across the hobby. Today, we'll start in no particular order with a look at two of the current Kickstarters with Alexis taking it away on Townsfolk Tussle, which we talked about in the last episode. Kickstarter finally went live and extremely surprisingly, the final price for the game is going to be only $85, which I think is really surprising and a great price for a game like this, especially since Townsfolk Tussle is slightly more quote unquote casual than other campaign oriented games it's something that quickly and that is less rule heavy as uh, some other games the kickstarter looks very nice it's already at uh, two hundred and fifty thousand dollar if i remember correctly um so it, it is well past its goal and i think that it will deliver sp- splendidly because they've shown uh, up until now at the very least a lot of uh, confidence and eagerness to to be with uh, to be along with the community and to really deliver a great product so i'm all on board with this one i think i wasn't planning to go on to another kickstarter this year but don't talk to us all kind of uh, won me over very quickly yeah absolutely the 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 devs have been fantastic quickly yeah absolutely the 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 devs have been fantastic they are blown away as well with everything that's going on i mean there there was a little bit of a a kerfuffle at the start they put out an early bird special for 70 dollars uh which for 100 people that's nothing in the first moments of a kickstarter when it hits live people thought they got it didn't get it uh upset they didn't get it i land in the camp of if you got that $70, then good for you. I didn't. I went in and clicked on the $85. I didn't even pay attention to the 70 I just went, whatever. I think I would have missed it anyway. It has a, you know, a little bit of a soured things. I spoke to a couple of the guys. You know, a little bit of a soured things. I spoke to a couple of the guys in the industry who've done Kickstarters, and they said, yeah, that's a bit of a like a, a newbie mistake. They it's their first Kickstarter. They didn't know that this could cause bad feelings. Um, but I will say, I don't have any, and I'm pleased that they're not doing anything. No Kickstarter exclusive. Doing anything. No Kickstarter exclusives. No, it doesn't feel like they're going to jam a load of add-ons in. They're just doing the game. The stretch goals are basically content going into the game. I think this is the kind of Kickstarter that should be going on the Kickstarter. First time company, first time game, simple product. You know what you're getting. My very favorite, Dark Light Memento Mori, which I often talk about, was one of those starting company. Everything came very quickly. Boom. You know, it was a I knew exactly what I was pledging for and what I was getting and fantastic. So I, I've been on board for a long time, but I'm really happy to see that it's turned out the way I want it to. Also, I also have to say it's actually very close to a finished product. Yeah, definitely. I would say that the game that they put on our table tabletop simulator would by itself would have been worth $85. I don't think that it would have been a bad price for what they, they've shown on tabletop simulator. And the final game is seems to be almost twice as big as what they've the final game is seems to be almost twice as big as what they've they've shown so far. So I'm uh, I'm really happy with what they are going for. Yeah, yeah, I absolutely agree. Like I when I first saw the demo and I was like, Okay, well, even if they had like just one or two more ruffians, this this is already good enough to go when I was thinking it'd be about a hundred dollars, you know, with a de- you know, with a decent maybe more cards and everything. Um but no, there's a there's an extra townsfolk there's loads of more ruffians yeah it's a really impressive piece of of um, production i i love it i'm i think that this is going to be a big hit uh, i think this also is going to mechanically because their ai system is a perfect mix of simple and crunchy it's just just almost just perfect especially for the kind of game they're going for and i do think that other companies should be taking note of this and looking at it and going, oh, this is how we should do our elites and our bosses. It's fantastic. And they have bought Dollies. So that's the perfect starter for 2020. For uh, people who don't know who bought Dollies is, actually it is a stretch goal uh, ruffian and is actually a dead on vacation. So no evil, evil intent whatsoever, a dead on vacation. So no evil evil intent whatsoever 
is just uh, a clumsy normal person trying to i think take pictures of the stuff in eureka springs feeling a lot of uh, sympathy for him i'm guessing yeah great yeah it feels now you now you've described it that way i know that the now you now you've described it that way i know that the name bought is a reference to the um simpsons which the devs uh mentioned um but also it feels a bit like mr magoo just kind of like in the wrong place at the wrong time, causing mayhem for people. And considering they're doing the old hosepipe style animation, I was. Oh, I know, I know. Yes, Mr. Magoo could be a reference. Of course, he's not blind, but yes. He's very oblivious, though, which kind of just sort of matches up, I think, a bit. Clumsily causes problems for people. So, yeah, yeah the, the programming looks like that. Yeah, it, that's that's a it's a necessarily have all guys as bad guys. Then on a not quite so overall positive, let's take a look at Darkest Dungeon. Is the other one which launched on exactly the same day. Uh, Audrey, I believe you have a bit more familiarity with um with Mythic Games Inc.'s previous projects. Yes, of course they're French, of course. <laughs> yes, of course they're French, of course. <laughs> Uh, if we look at the campaign of Darkest Dungeon, it has already reached two, uh, two million dollars, which is quite impressive, I would say, in, in a week or so. It's very heavy with miniatures, there are a lot of them. It's what we call them, it's what we call in French, I don't know if it's used everywhere, kiloplastic. One of the things that makes some people wary about this Kickstarter is that Mythic Games, if we look at their profile on Kickstarter, there are nine created projects. Among these nine created projects, there are five which are currently uh, standing. Two that are recently delivered, there is Super Fantasy Brawl, which is currently being uh, shipped to the backer. So I've seen already uh, quite a few people getting uh, their pledges and some mini paintings. So this one, I will not talk about it as much because we don't have much time. We haven't had much time to see what are the results. results. Rage Busters, which was the previous one uh, fulfilled, is currently waiting on Errata Packs. So that's something that people are worried about because Mythic Games often end up doing patches of their game six to six months to a year after the delivery. So that's something that you have to keep in mind is that often they're after the delivery. So that's something that you have to keep in mind is that often their rules will need to be patched. And then if we look at the five currently waiting projects, there is Solomon Kane, which is more than a year late. So even accounting uh, the current situation with COVID-19 in the world, they are more than six months late anyway. Then there was Time of Legends, Joanna of Fork 1.5. This one is very famous for its big, big dragon. There were some IP disputes with the rule writer. So that's something that we've seen a lot lately in French projects as well. Um, when there is some leg legal disputes over rules, contracts, and I think exactly in the other countries, but in French, we often say, oh, it's a hobby, it's going to be okay, are we between friends, etc. We hear that a lot from producers, from uh, game designers, and that's something to be very wary about because you need contracts, you need to have things written. And then there are Steam Watchers, and then there are Steam Watchers, and held two other games with uh, miniatures, so these are long to take. So Mythic Game is late in delivering too many projects for many people that would be interested in Darkest Dungeon. And that's one of the main issues that the people have with Darkest Dungeon. Mm, yeah. That's one of the main issues that the people have with Darkest Dungeon. Mm, yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I've backed this um, and I'd be, I, I jumped in on the backing with the idea of I'll back it and see what they're putting on their updates, and I can always just cut my reward down to one dollar if I end up changing my mind. The thing is, for the hobby aspect, because the models come in a different style to anything that's done before, they're very close to the actual game's artwork, which I've always loved. I mean, Darkest Dungeon is a, a video game experience that I rather watch people playing rather than play myself. So I'm not sure how much we're going to end up playing this, but I will say tell, but I wasn't particularly impressed to see that they put one of the heroes in as a, well, it actually says free only during this campaign. So maybe I'm not sure. I don't know what's happening with this. It says it's a Kickstarter exclusive that will not go to retail. 
and it's free only during this campaign. But then what, what is it going to be a store exclusive for them? Is it not going to be available in the future for them? Is it not going to be available in the future? Either way, I don't like exclusives that have actual game content in them. I mean, it's still like the, it's the miniatures and especially the guy who's painting them has done a fantastic work on it. Like really, really good job of replicating the style of the replicating the style of the of the video game but also keeping it more detailed and more alive it's it's um that's i think the biggest draw but yeah i mean i'm scrolling up and down this now and uh, yeah I, I what's that term you said kilo plastic yeah. you've unlocked this thing and it's going into the core box and i'm like well how i know this core box is going to be quite large but how big is it and and for me i'm an absolute inlay snob i'm not afraid of it. i want a game with a good inlay i don't want to have to go get a third party inlay i want especially miniatures games i want close up and fit properly when it's done and i i'm looking at this and i'm like is it is that going to happen certainly not going to get the crimson court pledge fitted into the main box by the look of it i mean that's so many more models so oh that's definitely a secondary box yeah yeah I saw the Super Fantasy Brawl boxes and saw the Super Fantasy Brawl boxes and the core box is big. I don't know if it's as big as Gloomhaven, but it seems to be very close to that. And it contains three or four different trays uh, inside to keep the miniatures and there are these big spots. I don't know um, what they are in the gameplay. Keep the miniatures and there are these big spots. I don't know um, what they are in the gameplay, but they're like goalposts or something like that and they are huge and they take lots of room and the, the inlays take lots of room mm. so in fact you, you you have a very big box compared to the exact quantity of minis that you have because it's skirmish so you don't really have millimeter scale as you have lots of empty space in the box i don't know how you can feel having that on that shelf for that amount of content but mm. the minis really look great for basic plastic for completely assembled thing and it's they really look good enough i'm just looking now noticing oh look the cove is an add-on it's not even part of my pledge so that's that's like an extra like my pledge is what 150 dollars yeah does it and it doesn't have the cove in it so now i'm like oh god well i i know if i back this i'm gonna have to spend an extra 50 dollars because i will want back this i'm gonna have to spend an extra 50 dollars because i will want to get the cove because crab people crab people yeah crab and and everything and i'm confused because the siren is listed in the stretch goal section uh, but then she's an alt boss for the cove so i would get the siren alt boss for the cove so i would get the siren but i wouldn't have the cove if i don't buy it as an add-on that doesn't feel good. The siren is a stretch goal for the cove because I got the KS update and it was listed under the cove on the, the title. The title. Yeah, but then yeah, uh, it looks like that. It, that doesn't feel great now that their stretch goals going into an add-on. No, not at all. Yeah. I suspect I'm still going to be buying this, but I think it will backing this and everything. But I think this will be a like I'll give them one shot because I've not backed their stuff before, so I won't won't be going with another one. So, yeah, I'll do the same. Yeah, give, give them a chance. I would tell you to expect a year later. Yeah. Oh, uh, the delay at this point now. I'm so used to be browbeaten into waiting for products to arrive that I'm I kind of resigned to it being like far later than they're saying into it being like far later than they're saying i mean uh god like just just to go on an aside i the um number of projects that are overdue and late for me is just kind of bonkers the one i'm still waiting for that they keep on pushing back is um siege of the citadel which is oh, yeah. um siege of the citadel which is oh yeah mophidius yeah. yes mophidius and that's like Let's have a look. That, yeah, I backed that. It's estimated delivery 2017. Yeah, Siege of the Citadel uh, for Mutant Chronicles. Mutant Chronicles is something that one of my um, friends, older brothers, used to play when he was younger. So I, one of my um, friends, older brothers, used to play when he was younger. So I was a bit of mild nostalgia. The the only thing the, the only thing really doing worse than that is my Seventh C pledge. So yeah, I'm kind of used to used to waiting. 
One thing that is good to point out is that um, Darkest Dungeon was originally uh, a Kickstarter game, and uh, the the video version was originally uh, a Kickstarter game, and uh, the the video game itself did incredibly well on Kickstarter and then mm -hmm. came out uh, pretty much on time and was great. But obviously, a board game is something incredibly different. We'll yeah. have to see how how this goes. I think for me, it's a case of like nostalgia and liking the setting and everything. I think for me, it's a case of like nostalgia and liking the setting and everything is is keeping me linked in here. But looking at the fine details, I'm like, do I? Do I really? If if I didn't have this money spare kicking around, would I? Would I stretch to this? And I don't think I, it liked unlike Townsfolk Tussle, which I could just wholeheartedly say, just back it, just get in there and back it. Don't really have a good think about it. Watch the videos of how people how it plays and look at the track record. You know? Yeah, it looks incredibly fiddly, mm. by the way. Yeah, I'm okay with fiddly. I'm okay with that. The thing that worries me is that it looks like the wrong kind of fiddly, I don't know. Because uh, when I saw playthrough video and there are um, cardboard tokens over cardboard uh, tokens which move uh, all around, so uh, it's kind of messy fiddly. Well, the, a lot of work will rely on how, how good the inlay is again, because like Gloomhaven, for example, I hated set up a breakdown of that game until I, and that just changed everything. That Then it's just so much faster. Yeah, I was about to say that it looks as fiddly as Gloomhaven without an app. <laughs> yeah. Well, um, speaking of Kickstarters, we're going to move on now to the next topic, which is another Kickstarter game, one which has actually been partially fulfilled. Another Kickstarter game, one which has actually been partially fulfilled, um, arrived with me uh, earlier this month. Uh, it was a bit of a surprise, actually. I just got a phone call from this delivery chap, and he's like, oh, I got something for you. And I was like, I'm not expecting any parcels, but okay, I'm in. And arrived in this box just with Horizon Zero Dawn, with Horizon Zero Dawn printed on it. So that's what I'm going to talk about now, because... Um, I've had a chance to play this a few times, and I think it's got some very good stuff. It's also got some stuff that's um, uh, like a bit of, you've got to be aware of this. So Horizon Zero Dawn is a world which follows Alloy, uh, a member of the Nora tribe, if I remember correctly. Uh, but this, they have they could have made a game that just followed Alloy and retold her story and they've instead chosen to take the setting and flesh it out and give you other experiences other other kind of characters so this is a one to four player semi cooperative hunting game and uh, it's semi cooperative in the same way that townsfolk tussle kind of is in that you win and lose together but one person gets to win a bit more than everyone else ultimately there can only be one everyone else ultimately there can only be one true winner but everybody can lose it's also um impressively it's an example of why the hunt mechanic from kingdom death is actually nicely designed if it gets fleshed out just a bit more because this is almost exclusively kid phase but padded out into a whole game um, with with encounters and everything so you start off you pick from four different uh, tribesmen they all have their own kind of slant they're represented by miniature but mechanically they are um, a character card down and you the equipment has little arcs on it it indicates if it goes on the left right top or bottom of the sheet um, and you can only have one in each of those arcs. So every character typically starts with armor at the bottom and then a weapon on the left and the right. Um, they have room at the top to get another piece of uh, of gear. Otherwise, they replace it. There is a, a deck of cards. I think this is a bit like Mage Knight in that you use the cards to attack with and do special actions. But also, if you run out of cards in your deck, you faint and the cards in your deck are also your health. You can craft to replenish them, but you're kind of managing your hand, managing your deck, while also kind of managing your hand, managing your deck, while also moving around and doing other things. Um, all of the characters are upgradable. They upgrade during a single like session, which takes place over five hunts. And um, they you have a little tree and you pick 
basically pick from between one or two and pick basically pick from between one or two and progress down the tech tree and it's one of those branching paths ones that if you go left then you're never going to be able to pick the far right bottom most upgrade if you go right you can't pick the far left and so on so it adds replayability and also gives you choices without overwhelming you with like here here's six character ability cards pick one of those instead of you with like here here's six character ability cards pick one of those instead it goes do you want this or do you want that uh, the gameplay loop itself is, um, as I said, like the Kingdom Death Hunt event. At the start of the game, you pick a target. In the core game, it's the Sawtooth. You put that down on the fifth space, an imaginary track. And then the rest of the encounters are 12 cards. Uh, they're four of each, so four level one, four level two, and four level three. And the leader of the hunt will draw three of these and pick one. Uh, which means on the first hunt you're always picking a level one but on the second hunt you have a choice between a level one and two level two, three level threes so you get on the second and third hunt a choice of do i play it safe do we play it safe or do we push it a bit and go for the harder monsters harder machines um, the advantage of taking on the harder ones sooner is the um, merchants will offer better gear after a hunt for you to exchange for change for but the risk is they're harder uh, regardless of whether you succeed or fail, you're going to level up. But you, uh, you're good. Sorry, if you, you're going to get to buy gear. Sorry, if you fail, you don't get to level up though. So that's like the risk. And an additional mechanic they added is the fledgling mechanic. They get an event deck. If the fledgling is a person. Fledgling mechanic. They get an event deck. If the fledgling is a person who is on the least points. Um, so they're doing the worst. They get a little. Draw three cards. Pick one and get a little bit of a boost for. The upcoming encounter so it's kind of nice because the person who's doing best gets to pick the encounter they think yeah these are the kind of things i want to gets to pick the encounter they think yeah these are the kind of things i want to fight and the person who's doing worst gets a little bonus to help them out like maybe they get to go first or they get bonus glory points or bonus resources or something i like that loop and i while playing it i was like this this does remind me of the kingdom death hunt track except I feel this does remind me of the Kingdom Death Hunt track, except I feel like I'm making choices because I'm picking from three different cards. So it feels like I'm I'm not necessarily just going on this track left, right. I'm making decisions. The other part of the game is the encounters. They take place on a few boards, double sided. Um, they have, uh, I think it's 16 squares on each. And um, you've got various different types of terrain, some spaces that are variable in what will be in them, um, routes that the AI follow, and then sort of like tall grass and rocks to jump off and stuff. The AIs initially usually always set up on these little arrow routes, interesting kind of choices when you're playing the encounter. They're not aware you're there. They're not going to be aware until you they discover you or you attack them. But when they're unaware, they just move along the route. If they get to the final square, they'll step off. And that's it. You can't kill them. You can't get the glory points for them. You can't get the resources for them. So, them. so sometimes you're looking like, do we attack this one? Do we let it go? When you do finally attack them, they switch to following an AI, which in most cases is a single card. Uh, it has like a if or generally. Uh, the watchers, for example, who are the most basic enemy, will either try and alert another unalerted enemy, will either try and alert another unalerted uh, machine if it's near enough or they will um, they'll start attacking and that's very basic the grazers are similar very basic one card they try and run away off the board um, but the the scrappers are a bit more aggressive however the shellbacks are a bit more aggressive however the shellbacks which are crabs crab machines and the sawtooths at the end have an ai deck which is like a thumbs up it's small there's three cards for the shellback and four for the um, sawtooth, so I think they could have had more cards, but it does add just enough variety in cards, but it does add just enough variety into how they behave that you're kind of like, okay, okay, these things feel more dangerous and they're a bit more unpredictable. The game also has mechanics for um, uh, damaging parts of the monster's machines before uh, you kill them. In the or you can go and break its cargo um, uh, cargo containers and get the resources you would have got for killing it ahead of time. So you can just run in and go, I don't care about you. You have the glory points for killing that. I just want the stuff. Um, very nice. Every encounter, you have to get a certain number of glory points or you fail it. 
or if uh, ev so you have to work together. Just like really good, really intuitive. You get with it, you click with how it works very quickly, and um, it's it sits together very nicely. This seems like a really interesting aspect that we don't see enough in games. Mm. And I can see it, I don't see enough in games. Mm. And I can see it helping reinforcing the uh, hunting teams uh, of yeah. Horizon Zero Dawn. As much as I like Kingdom Death, the showdown really never feel like a, a hunt, but no. rather a, a very cool boss battle. Yeah. Well, the edge of the board in Kingdom Death, obviously, it just feels like a solid wall around the Kingdom Death. Obviously, it just feels like a solid wall around the outside. This doesn't. This feels like, oh, that is a, an extra space that's beyond our range. They're going to run away. So yeah, it does. It does really do that quite nicely. So the best things about this, I think it is mechanically unique and interesting. It is, they've taken the characters of playing, like the Kaja warrior, ideal conditions. They attack from stealth. The Nora marksman shoots and breaks pieces on the um, on on the machines first. Very specialised about damaging components first. The Banuk is um, uh, a dodge based character, so very evasive. Trapper, so literally lays traps in advance to get the machines to walk into, which is also very cool because you can look and you go, okay, well that that machine over there is a bit far away. Uh, I don't want to get off the board, so I'll put a trap on the last space. If it steps into the trap, it's going to get alerted. But we can we can go for kill something else, knowing that that is going to not. We can go for kill something else, knowing that that is going to not leave. And it's stuff like that's really great. On top of it, as I mentioned before, I'm an inlay snob. Oh, excuse me. And this game has one of the best inlays, and in fact, some of the best quality I've experience some of the best quality i've experienced the whole thing feels luxurious um you want to go on board game geek and look at the inlays the box the cards everything apart from the rule book is linen finish the the rule book is a really nice thick gloss paper uh, beautifully laid you're look, going back and trying to find something this is all really well done and laid out the models a bit too small but they are made of a very heavy, crisp PVC. I don't know what PVC this is, but it is. I wish if people are going to make stuff out of PVC, they'd use this instead. It's it's got sharp detail, stuff like my Teenage Ninja Turtles. Um, it just feels so much better. The only better PVC models I've encountered are the Darklight Memento Mori ones, which are my all-time favourites. It's gorgeous. The downside of it is, it's a hundred dollars. To be honest. It isn't really a hundred dollars worth of content. It it isn't really a hundred dollars worth of content. It does feel like it's worth a hundred dollars, but you're getting five different machines, four different hunters, and the final encounter every time is the same. It's the same sawtooth. It's the same layout. The only difference is are you one and two play out. The only difference is are you one and two players or are you three and four players, which makes the game feel like you need the expansions. And I don't think that's a great deal, which is a shame because Steamforge games in the past for me have been a series of misses. This was their last chance. And they've mechanically and them this was their last chance. And they've mechanically and thematically impressed me. Like everything about playing this game is immense fun and feels good and looks good. But when I get to to the end of it, I'm like, well, I'm going to play this as it stands three, four times, maybe three, four times, maybe. And then maybe maybe once to try each of the different hunters, maybe an extra time to try an alternate route on one I really enjoy. But that's it. And it genuinely feels like a game where they're saying, hey, you want to enjoy this? Get the uh, you've got to get some expansions get the uh you've got to get some expansions the expansions look great i've got them coming in the summer and i'll probably revisit this when when they come in but yeah it's i can't i can't recommend it to someone who's on a budget at all which is a shame because it's gorgeous it's brilliant it's genuinely one of the brilliant. it's genuinely one of the best games i've played this year yeah you got me interested so uh, the the morale of the story is that uh, Steam Project Games did one right at the first try. Yeah. 
I, I, I've, I've yet, I'm not saying there isn't, I'm not saying there isn't, but I've yet to encounter a typo. I've yet to encounter a rule um, where I'm like, I don't understand this. They've got examples on pretty much every section you need. Whenever you're looking for a, a section, it's all nicely listed. Like, oh, how to perform a ranged attack. Oh, there's all the steps. And for a melee attack, they, they've even been attack, they, they've even been smart enough to say, hey, a melee attack's like a ranged attack, but this, the first step is different. Yeah, it, it's it all looks good, um, and I think they've done justice to the setting because the game is is I love it. I love the game so much. I think it's a wonderful setting and world, and I'm glad they did that justice. Expansions to work out what's going to make it feel complete. I was wondering what kind of um, evolution can the characters see through the game? Uh, as in, can they level up or gain new gear or get better? Uh, what what makes every hand more tactically different from the other? So, different from the other. So the hunts themselves across the levels will have more and more dangerous foes. So the level ones will have typically watchers and maybe a scrapper, but the and the level twos are more likely to have grazers that are prone to running away um, or maybe shellbacks. So that's the gradual escalation. Not a lot of variety in your choices. You've only got four of each. As if for the characters, um, they have their own little card uh, with the branching trees. And whenever you pick, you get more abilities or um, items to put into your action deck. So you might gain um, a couple of new abilities that let you... Uh, I think if I grab one of the characters now, I'll, I'll walk through. Uh, let's get the, the one I'm most familiar with is the Forge Smith. As you, you level up, you go, oh, I, I, your first choice is if you successfully complete the level one hunt, you get the choice to level up and you can either take a blative arm. You get the choice to level up and you can either take a blative armor or fire forged. So a blative armor is um, a, a, just an ability. You tuck it under your armor and it um, makes him, allows him to discard salvage to get extra chances to evade or fire forge allows him to inflict fire damage. And then... When you level, say you picked Fireforged, you could have the choice to become a Forge Master or Heart of the Furnace on the second level. But in addition to that, killing, uh, destroying machines gives you resources, uh, scrap or some specific different kinds of um, types of resource. And you can trade those, which includes new weapons, new armor, utility items, um, coils that upgrade your weapons, that you tuck them underneath things like that. The merchant's nicely designed in that the level of the gear you get is linked to the level of the encounter you just attempted, succeed or lose. And it's offer the same types of stuff. So for example, there'll always be one piece of armor. If you buy that, then it, you'll draw a new piece of armor from their deck. So there'll, there'll be something available for everyone. You can't just buy out all of the weapons and leave everyone else without any options. So yeah, it's through the merchant and any options. So yeah, it's through the merchant and through leveling up. Um, the merchant provides a more random kind of leveling up and the tree gives you more control of where you're going. Okay, I see. Thanks for the answer. That answers my question. Yeah, I, I think you get maybe two, three different, maybe four set with each hunter if you really want to explore everything they could do and then you'd be fairly aware of it. Because they're, um, they have a deck and you don't do deck thinning, the vast majority of what the characters do uh, with their cards stays the same from one hunt to another because you're less likely to draw the new cards you've got early on. They'll get mixed in. I would say if you've got the money, um, it is definitely a recommendation. Um, if you caught it on the Kickstarter and you're still waiting for it to arrive because you didn't have it part shipped, you're going to have a good thing coming when it arrives with everything else and all the expansions. But um, for everyone else, just, you know, there, there may be better things to more complete experiences to purchase. Like Fireteam Zero, for example, uh, you could buy the core box of that, and I think that's all you need. Um, this definitely feels like you're going to end up having to buy more if you really enjoy it. Or if you're the kind of person who likes the same stuff and likes to, who likes the same stuff and likes to, explore the same kind of rogue light experience but with slight variations you may enjoy it there so yeah 
Uh, speaking of um, gear and uh, rogue-like and rogue-light kinds of experiences, that brings us to our KDM section for our resident. Already, oh, then KDM expert is a bit too much, maybe. Okay, it has been uh, quite the quiet month because we got an update for a long time, and at the time of recording this podcast, we finally got an update. So I will just talk about the facts about Kingdom Dead. Let's go to http kingdomdeath.com slash rules. You will find an updated FAQ and glossary because it has it is actually around for a couple of months, but I don't I still see people who uh, don't know that there is an updated living uh, that there is an updated living uh, frequently asked questions and glossary. So uh, have a look because it's worth it and there's the microwave the Dra dragon king rule so that's actually a good thing yeah i think it's worth just briefly mentioning that because um i'm not sure everyone's aware where that comes from um during the time in that because um i'm not sure everyone's aware where that comes from um during the times when adam was actually corresponding with people on twitter as opposed to disappearing uh i jokingly chucked my Dragon King in a microwave, sent him a picture and asked if I got any benefits for it. And he uh, he said, yeah, you get plus one damage for microwave benefits for it. And he uh, he said, yeah, you get plus one damage for microwave in your Dragon King. Um, and that's an official rule now. So this is it. And uh, the first, uh, okay, uh, what you need to know is that this time there was the kind of that this time there was a kind of uh, ask me anything session on Kickstarter comments. And uh, this is terrible because uh, Kickstarter comments are terrible to read, are a dreadful experience to wait through, and they have a horrible, horrible nesting. So I would really, really be grateful if next time Adam would use something like Reddit or uh, even a because it would be a lot more readable. He could just say, put up a post saying, please ask your questions in the comments. I will respond next week with a post with the answers. And then he could just put people's questions. Yeah, it's sometimes a little bit annoying when he does that uh, kind of Q&A in the Kickstarter comments, because it will definitely be lost in the sense of time. And uh, as poor podcasters have to take snapshots and pictures and keep reference of everything. So yeah, please Adam, <laughs> update us uh, with something, update us uh, with something uh, which is referenceable. So this being said, uh, the first important thing for everyone is that uh, there will be no core box reprint for Black Friday. So if you are saving your pennies, uh, hoping to score a core box with a discount, uh, for somewhere next year or just spend it uh, in another way or uh, please don't go to a base scalping because uh, it will eventually be restocked anyway yeah. i i do think that is uh, the situation that's going on with covid-19 has impacted on man the situation that's going on with covid-19 has impacted on manufacturing worldwide so it's understandable but we were in this situation before COVID-19 kicked in. So I don't think we can really say it is because of coronavirus, the pandemic, really. This is this is an ongoing issue, as people have, should be very familiar. This is this is an ongoing issue, as people have, should be very familiar, who wanted the most popular expansions. It's a bit of a shame. Yeah. About news, there is that, uh, uh, actually Adam admitted that uh, the plan is to support People of the Lantern and existing campaigns into advanced of this means, but there will be probably a way to play legacy campaigns with a new system, and this is a thing to know. Now, uh, let's keep on hold all the speculation because this could literally mean everything. So let's wait. That was basically the point of uh, to, to update the past campaign into the, the new system. But it's good to know that it will actually support Lantern and that we won't have to um, play people of the, of the Dream Keeper. To, yeah, Dream Keeper. To, to play as the, the modern slash advanced KDM. It's good to know that that Lantern would slash advance KDM. It's good to know that that Lantern will be updated in some ways, though I don't expect it to be um, fixed. 
yeah, another thing to know about this is that actually it's Adam's intention to split Web3 in three shippings if uh, looks like a campaign of that will be delaying the delivery of the rest of the stuff. Anyway, it's not entirely a fact, so let's keep it, let's get this uh, as it is. Anyway, uh, another news is that uh, legendary car pack is late. So this is this is it for infamous strain, which uh, was uh, which had the condition of losing to the Ghost Mock Knight, but uh, that, that got moved to campaign of death, and legendary car back is now about to, to go to print, but uh, keep the news that it is late. Uh, about regional warehouses, I uh, think uh, that has to be noted, it is, it is that for Europe, UK warehouse looks like it is going to stay because uh, Adam has no alternatives and actually he doesn't know how it will. In the meantime, it seems that UK warehouse is going to stay. And well, uh, I think that uh, all, the, um, all the older Among Us uh, have uh, caught the reference to Prince of Persia in the animated GIF of the Twilight Knight dying like that with the white. I just want to go back and say um, him not sorting this out and leaving the, uh, the UK warehouse is worst case scenario for people in Europe because we're going to be facing customs charges on these things. And uh, some people backed under the understanding that they wouldn't be getting customs charges. So, you know, and we're not talking customs charges. So, you know, and we're not talking small ones either. You know, this is um, customs charges on a, a few thousand dollars worth of stuff. I, I'm a bit afraid about when my gambler's chest arrives, because even if French is not too bad for customs, gambler's chest will be over the threshold and I'm... Ah! Ah, not really expecting it anxiously now. Yeah, yeah, you get the additional cost, you get the additional delays, because customs, like, for, at least for me over here in Sweden, customs adds on uh, a week at least, sometimes more than that in delays. Yeah. Um, and the costs, you know, are, are it's, um, he's had more than long enough to sort out some center, and considering how prestigious and, like, popular this product is, a European distribution center deal could have easily been sorted by now but i suspect like many things he's dealing with too much stuff um personally and um and just logistics yeah uh actually the logistics part has been uh, neglected for a long time so actually we europeans would need a better way to get miniatures also because uh, basically every sale you get smitten with uh, 20 to uh, basically every sale you get smitten with uh, 20 to 40 euros just to get the stuff uh, everyone else gets uh, with reasonable costs yeah especially on a, a mini that is already um, 20 to, to 30 uh, dollars it, it quickly adds up you know kingdom death only sells two or thirty dollars it, it quickly adds up you know kingdom death only sells two or three new minis at a time if ever that so you know you you can't really buy in bulk to to save yourself on custom costs in europe um that has been a problem for years and it's kind of a shame to see that uh, adam is not really do it's been a problem for years and it's kind of a shame to see that uh, adam is not really doing anything on that i think that this update really does not give any good information uh although it seems like adam C wants to be committed in having um you know everything about the gc done with uh within the next done with uh within the next uh three months from what he said in the comments the problem is that we really have no idea uh, what that means he wants to have everything um sent to the factories for chinese new year uh and he plans to have things uh them you know it will definitely have two three four five months of delays um it's kind of a shame that that every time that he, he says something even if it sounds hopeful we've heard it before uh, yeah two years ago he, he said that the the gambler's chest was almost finished uh and then you know retracted that laid it again and it's just mm -hmm. uh, i don't think that the community can can really uh trust what he has to say 
And so an update where it just gives this word about this kind of things really seems uh, quite pointless, to be honest. It's cool to see a couple of pictures, but I feel that if add through an entire monster, for example, and it demoed, uh, demoed the Crimson Croc, for example, and showed to the, the backers what a new fight looked like, it would be a lot more interesting and it would um, you know, could make people a lot more eager to wait for it. Because right now I don't feel anything in that update. If he had just shown, let's say, the, the, the basic traits of the, the Crimson Croc, at least I would have something to, to chew on, <laughs> uh, so to say. And it's not as if, you know, he, he couldn't send that since it's already ready. We, we've seen that it's already planned and uh, that some of the monsters are finished. I don't, under don't understand why Adam keeps being tightly lipped uh, about the gameplay since we will all end up getting it. Would love to see that actually. Yeah, I, I to go back and look at what when it's been done right because you know we would like when it's been done correctly. The demos for Gen Con, uh, the demos for Gen Con uh, 2018 and 2019, I think, with the um, Black Knight, the Screaming God, and then the Frog Dog that came along afterwards. Those, brilliant. They were curated. They only showed a little snapshot of what was going to be coming, but it was still exciting. It was like, oh my goodness, look, let's get some screenshots of all this. But it was still exciting. It was like, oh my goodness, look, let's get some screenshots of all this gear. Look, look, look at what the uh, Frog Dog armor is proposed to be doing. And this is what the Frog Dog does. And oh, look at that board for the Black Knights. Yeah, it was, uh, it, it was. Uh, it was really um, interesting uh, and exciting. And also what he did with the Crimson Croc was also very interesting. He showed a few traits. He showed some pieces of uh, gear and everything. And I was like, Ooh, this is this is meaty. There's enough here that you're like, what does that do? What does this do? But uh, to speculate on, to try and... I think he could have done a lot better by, yeah, putting like, I don't know, here's a... Here's a, here's a a piece of gear you're going to get from the Smog Singers because we've seen the artwork. Why can't we see one of the pieces of of gear? Or you know, this is the set bonus for this armor set or something. Or uh, hey, here's some AI cards. Or oof, this, or oof, this is the this is the title for the King's Trap or something. I don't know. Just just some solid teasers. Um, so yeah, it's. I, I'm with you. I think we've been burnt so many times in respect to Adam promising things on delivery and not getting there. But we've also seen he can do it right. We've also seen he can do it right. He can get it right. Um, sometimes overcompensating with too much information, like some of his posts have been three, four updates worth of stuff dumped in one go, and then you get ones like this, which are kind of there was nothing really in the post and the, the information was in the comments you know can you get a communications director maybe like a publicist somebody to handle this because this is really inconsistent and frustrating you know of course and uh, actually uh, uh, speaking of which uh, the last very good update uh, i read about the mechanic of wounding the crimson croc because that actually looked interesting. And then, uh, yes, Millennia, I love you talk. In the end of the updates, there were a few very interesting pictures of upcoming miniatures, upcoming miniature concepts. I really love seeing this, I really love seeing this, seeing a bit behind the scenes of what is being prepared. But I think it belongs in the in this official website newsletter, not in a Kickstarter news, but it's really something that as uh, mainly a miniature painting, it's really something that I love. Yeah, yeah, yeah it's it's cool to see. It's really something that I love. Yeah, yeah, yeah it's it's cool to see them. Actually, uh, I think that the better facts about this update were about the hard plastic shot on board because uh, we saw a picture and we can come out with a couple of interest. Is that uh, it looks like Adam is considering uh, uh, printing it in uh, three by three uh, blocks like the Black Knight demo, and that was awesome. Uh, or uh, is also considering doing that with a, a single square squad on board, and that is less awesome, I'd say. Yeah, yeah. 
It's um, as I say this. I'm sure once it comes out, it's going to be as good as the current stuff is, and as well received by its community and enjoyed um, by those people who like to dismantle and dissect the puzzles. That <laughs> I really hope he doesn't push anything back any further. I hope he sticks on what he's saying here. Um, I am concerned about Chinese New Year, which always tends to have some delays and everything, and he he's admitted that as well. So. You know, we'll uh, we'll see where he gets on this. Yeah, definitely. Uh, I'm I, I'm always about the the plastic showdown since I was one of the stupid people that went for it. <laughs> <laughs> it it's a bit of a shame to um uh to still not know why it was delayed, but I hope that Adam will find a good um uh something that works, and if possible, that that Adam will find a good um. Uh, something that works and if possible that he will you know ask the community what they want and go with the three by three um a solution that seems to be um to be quite good he's got a track record of communicating well with the community and asking what they want a solution that seems to be um to be quite good he's got a track record of communicating well with the community and asking what they want and and following that and delivering so we'll see how it goes uh it's time now to um just close out with a final thing which to continue on our kind of kickstarter theme is a look a look at compulsive buying uh fear of missing out and more with audrey as Fen just said fear of missing out is something that we you will often see written as f o m o that's like i want this what can i do if i don't get this product it's really the fear that you really make you buy something that maybe you wouldn't have bought another way so companies will try to use this to get you into buying stuff why do we have this fear of missing out there are several reasons one of them can be that if you are part of a community and in one of them can be that if you are part of a community and in this community many people play one game or another game and everyone has their own copy or their own uh, deck if it's a card building game or anything and the, the new one comes out you will think that oh maybe there are some new elements some new cards the new one comes out you will think that oh maybe there are some new elements some new cards that I won't have, I will miss on gameplay elements if I don't have it, and so you will be more tempted to buy it. So it has to be something that really makes you buy. The other thing is, if it's an element that has just one, you will get some limited release, you will get some, let's say, time limited offers, or Kickstarter exclusive, as we mentioned very early when talking about Tunfold Tussle that doesn't really have it, and Darkest Dungeon that relies on it. Work hard to provide their campaigns, to provide their websites with that kind of items. There are different ways to make it work. In my opinion, some are really great and some are borderline predatory, if not more than borderline. For in, if we look at Kickstarter exclusive, Bonus or items in some Kickstarter, there are expansions that are limited to the Kickstarters. These are really to make you have the fear of missing out. These are here to make you think, oh, I'm going to miss out. And it's especially uh, working buyers. There are a lot of people that like to go all in because they will say, oh, I have a full collection. That's liking to own stuff and there's nothing wrong in it essentially, but companies can prey on it. They can use it to make you get more stuff in it. They can use it to make you get more stuff that you, than you would have otherwise. The Kickstarter exclusive items bonus really work on that. Limited items, often, they are because companies want to make their money back on a sock, their money back, on a certain period of time and then there will be just bonus for instance there is a miniature company which is called spira mirabilis they're spanish and they release one bust every two or three months during a weekend only that bust will only be available on each miniature then it's done and they can go work on the next one 
This is very useful for them because they really have a budget that's completely tight and they close it in two weeks. Uh, in, in, they have a budget that's completely tight and they can close it in we are and what's going to happen next. In the miniature industry, recast is something that happens a lot. So there will be illegal copies of the miniatures made in China. The limited editions can serve resist this because they know that they won't lose more sales after the but they won't lose more sales after the, the initial release due to copies swarming the market at a much lower price. So it's annoying because the buyers will feel compelled to buy at that time and will also and will also if they miss it, they will feel compelled to buy it second hand at people that will scalp often. So sell at a much higher price than the original one. For instance, some of the Spira Mirabilis bus can be resold for free the worse it gets. So these are the parts where, in my opinion, it's borderline predatory, but companies do this, there's a reason behind it. But there's also other things that they can do, which I personally prefer. It's the example in Kickstarter, a discount for the first hundred backers. The other don't miss out on anything. They miss out on a discount. Yeah, but most of the time they were planning to buy it anyway. It's not a breaking point. Some of our campaigns and companies use the extra miniature 48 hours and they sometimes make it available as an add-on for the people that are not there initially. That's something that I personally stand behind. I like it because you're not missing out on anything and it's not compelling you to buy. It's not making you feel, oh, I missed an option to get it. And that's why I hope that the miniature of Darkest Dungeon will be available at some other point in another way or something, because the way it's worded makes me feel that there will be something. So yeah, it's a tool for companies to make people buy stuff or to make people that's a bit different. I feel that it's always a bit of a problem when a Kickstarter does that for gameplay elements. Um, I am perfectly fine when it's just for some vanity things. For example, uh, Seventh Continent had a miniature for the for the Kickstarter exclusive. Had a miniature for the for the Kickstarter exclusive, and those were non-gameplay related. People could simply, um, you know you stand E instead of the miniatures and they're not really something that you would um, feel bad you know you stand E instead of the miniatures and they're not really something that you would um, feel bad if you didn't had in the uh, when buying the game so it's it's just a basically a pre-order that you are doing for something that might end up be really bad it's always you are doing for something that might end up being really bad. It's always, I think, uh, a bit of a gamble. And I would say that people should probably try to just buy the, the base game first and then uh, see if they enjoy it. Uh, and if they do, it's probably going to appear on, it's probably going to appear on uh, eBay for not too much money at some point. Yeah, yeah, they do. Um... I wanted to talk a little bit about this from sort of a personal experience. I have a, a bit of a problem, and I know many people within the board gaming do as well, being completionists. Uh, you know, I'm just talking about this. Some of you will be like, oh, yeah, that's me as well. I, I don't really want to own something if I can't have have all of it. Oh, yeah, that's me. Yeah, yeah and, and that's frustrating. But it's also created this situation where I now have a preference for self-contained, this is it in one box, or Big t Trouble in Little Time, China. That came out with a deluxe edition that um, shipped with everything plus the expansion in it. I bought that. That's it. I've never had to get anything else. That box sits on my shelf, uh, and we bring it out and play it occasionally. And I'm really happy with it. And then there's Fireteam Zero. I love Fireteam Zero. Uh, it's, it's an amazing game. It's an amazing game. I will talk about it at some point on here. 
but I can't get the Europe cycle and the and there's a couple of the small car packs I can't get. They don't appear in the secondary market anywhere. And it, it annoys me. It does. It's like there's a whole section of missions that's missing. I can't get to play them. Uh, Rising Sun, though, was the biggest them. Uh, Rising Sun, though, was the biggest like breaking point for me on this because I've got all of Rising Sun apart from the neoprene mat and the um, and the plastic fortresses for the Moon and Sun dynasties. And you cannot get those fortresses set, and you cannot get those fortresses separately anywhere because everyone wants to sell them with the the other uh, Kickstarter stuff. Well, you know, fair enough. But that means I I can't finish my Rising Sun um thing when the come on did their uh, time machine. I think it was. I I, I backed it. Dean, I think it was. I, I I backed it to try and get in and get those missing pieces, and they didn't produce enough. They were sold out to all of the premium people before I even got a chance to get in there. And that was kind of the moment where I went, you know what, I'm I'm not bothering with come on stuff anymore because they make it full of all the in um and it's just this seller's market. So I, I as I love Rising Sun and you know, I would think it's one of the best games on my shelf. But it's also a blight. It makes me unhappy to look at it. Yeah, about uh, this is a plus for Tom's so, uh They had a very good. They have a very good way to give you a Kickstarter exclusive, which is not game content but feels exclusive. Because uh, for a pledge, you can you can get your name on a tombstone or get your name on a tombstone on the cover art of the game on the box. So. That a pretty good way to pay a bit more to fund the project you believe in and get something very exclusive and very for you and for you only in the meantime so for you and for you only in the meantime so that's uh, great kudos to team they are great yeah yeah they've really done a lot right i think they've only had one misstep so far um, I, I look forward to seeing what they do after this. <laughs> we will follow their career with great interest. Uh, it's a Star Wars uh, quote. Yeah. 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 I mean, I, I just thinking about it, now I'm looking around on the shelf and I'm looking at the stuff that I'm most happy with. And it's things like Dark Light Memento More, where everything arrived in one go, or Vampire Hunters, which is the only one go, and I don't have to worry about any of it again. Or uh, On Mars, which I still haven't had a chance to play, but it's a complete game in one box. And it's like, yeah, you know, that's, you know, it's great. Um, and I wish more companies would just just get away from this model. It is, it, it feels. It is. It, it feels bad, and I genuinely think that they're losing out on business. Um, promos, and it, do alternate sculpts, do fancy sculpts or nice alternate art or something. Don't don't lock bits and pieces away uh, so that they end up with mismatched boards where four. Uh, so that they end up with mismatched boards where four players have the a nice plastic fortresses and the other players have little flat pieces of cardboard. You know. One thing that I think is very interesting is if we look at the two most funded Kickstarters in board games, the so Gloomhaven, and rely on exclusive stuff to bring people in theory, because in reality, production amounts can be a bit of a difference, but in theory, they don't rely on that to attract people. And I think that's really nice. Yeah, it's a lot to think about. So that brings us to time on this episode. If anything that you want to say or comment, you can catch each of us at our various uh, social media places. I can be located on Instagram, Patreon, and Twitter as Fen Paints, F E N Paints, all one word. Uh, and um, Alexis? I can be found here on Fen's Discord, otherwise, on Twitter at uh, Alexis M4ES. That's pretty much it. Audrey? Uh, I can be found on a few Discord servers, uh, the mini painting one, 
the Lantern's Reign, One for Kingdom Death, and of course, Fans Discord. On Instagram, I am Millennia underscore Minis. Adelacio. Well, you can find me with the uh, nickname Techlist uh, with the three instead of the he. And uh, basically, everywhere is the same everywhere. So, BGG, Discord, or Twitter, or Reddit, or everywhere. I'm mostly on BGG. Okay, podcast. And we will be catching you next time. So, until then, be safe, have fun gaming. Bye. 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 Bye.